on the face of it, the death of Jesus looks simply like a man-made tragedy and a grave miscarriage of justice. But the extraordinary darkness of verse 33 and the excruciating cry of verse 34, they tell us there is something supernatural that is taking place as Jesus hangs on that cross. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And today we take a look at what Jesus did accomplish on the cross. And Jonathan, I'd love for you to give us just a little, little bit of context here. When we talk about the extraordinary darkness, the excruciating cry, what, what are you referring to there? Well, as we hear the story of Easter, uh, as we look at the picture of the cross that's given to us in Mark's gospel, there are certain things that Mark, the gospel writer, wants to highlight for us from the events of the Easter story and the crucifixion of Jesus. And he wants to highlight in particular the darkness that descends at the time of Jesus' death. Even during the daytime, it becomes dramatically dark. And as we set that within the, the context of the story of the Bible, we learn that that darkness carries symbolic significance. And then when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, there's a background to that in the story of the Bible that, that fills it with rich significance. And as we pay attention to those details in the story, we come to a deeper understanding of the meaning of those events. And, and that's something that we're going to explore in our message today. Well, we're going to do that from the book of Mark, chapter 15. So grab a Bible and join us there as we begin our message, Access Restored. Here is Jonathan. One of the great themes of our age is the theme of access. Our television screens and news pages are filled with stories of people trying to gain access to new lands and stories of national leaders seeking to control borders and, and limit access. It's a constant theme, you'll know, in Europe. It's the subject of a major debate in the United States, and it's a topic of much soul-searching here in Canada as well. Good Friday is about many things. It's about pain and injustice. It's about promise and fulfillment. It's about sacrifice and cost. It's about love and forgiveness. It's about death and life. It's about all those things. But in a very fundamental way, Good Friday is about access. Access not to another land or a better life, but access to the very presence of God himself. We've recently been studying the early chapters of the book of Genesis over recent weeks. We've been thinking about life in this world as God created it to be, as it was meant to be. We're told in those early chapters of the opening book of the Bible how God made man and woman and placed the first man and the first woman in a beautiful garden called Eden. You know the story. It was a place where God would meet with his people and where they would have access to him, to friendship with him, and to his life-giving presence. We're told of how God used to come down in the cool of the afternoon and meet with Adam and speak with him as a friend even speaks with his friend. We haven't yet reached the third chapter of Genesis in our little series, but it's a dark chapter. It's the chapter really where everything goes wrong and where the story starts to unravel. The man and the woman, they spurn God's friendship and they reject his rule. They decide to disobey the one prohibition that he has set out for them for life in the garden. And because they do that, their friendship with their maker is severed, and they invite his judgment. Adam and Eve are sent away from the garden, cast out from God's life-giving presence there. And because, of course, God the Creator is the source of all life, separated from him, the man and the woman begin to die. They begin to die physically, and they die spiritually, on the day that they leave Eden. 
And from that point on, really, the story of the Bible is the story of a quest to get back to Eden, to have that friendship with God restored, to regain access to him and to his life-giving presence. It's a dramatic story, and as we read it through in a linear way, we don't quite know how it's all going to work out and how the story will end. There are great hints along the way through the Bible's narrative of what God might do and what God would do to restore the relationship and to open up access once more. But it's not until the unjust, tragic, and dark events of Good Friday that we see how God is going to allow his created people into his presence once again. The story of Good Friday is as tragic as it is majestic. We're kind of jumping into the middle of the story here as we land in Mark 15. As we pick up the narrative, we find that the best man who has ever lived has been put on trial on false and trumped up charges. If we had time to read the whole of Mark's gospel and the account of Jesus' life, we would Read of a man who had compassion on the needy, who healed the sick, who cared for the poor. We'd read of a preacher who spoke words of grace and hope and truth. We'd observe a life full of integrity and goodness, the like of which we've never seen before or since. But now this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, has been beaten mocked and abused. And here he hangs on a Roman cross, the cruelest instrument of torture and death known to the ancient world. And as he hangs dying on this cross for crimes that he did not commit and of which he was not guilty, Mark wants us to see that two very significant things are taking place, two very significant things are happening, which will shape and reshape the very course of human history. And the first one is this, at the cross of Jesus, judgment falls. At the cross, judgment falls. Notice verse 33 with me again. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the face of it, the death of Jesus looks simply like a man-made tragedy and a grave miscarriage of justice. But the extraordinary darkness of verse 33 and the excruciating cry of verse 34, they tell us that something else is going on here. It's not simply a human drama. There is something supernatural that is taking place as Jesus hangs on that cross. We might want to write off the darkness of verse 33 as simply a case of heavy cloud cover, a spot of bad weather, But it's clearly more than that. It's a darkness that covers the whole land, the whole earth. And it comes at a time of day when it couldn't possibly be wholly dark. It comes at the sixth hour, that's 12 noon. And it lasts until the ninth hour, that's three in the afternoon. This is no ordinary darkness. It is a supernatural darkness, and it is full of significance. Darkness in the Bible always carries huge symbolic weight. Perhaps the most famous darkness in Scripture comes in the book of Exodus, when Israel is in bondage in Egypt. The Lord sends a series of plagues on the Egyptians to punish them for their mistreatment of his people. And one of those great judgments is the plague of darkness, that covers the land of Egypt. It is a sign of the Lord's great displeasure and of his judgment of evil. When divine darkness falls, it is a fearful thing. And remarkably, when Jesus, the righteous one, this sinless man, the 
son of God himself dies this death of injustice, God's judgment falls. We might assume that his judgment should be falling on the evildoers who are the perpetrators of this great crime, who have subjected Jesus to this great act of cruelty. But the words of Jesus in verse 34 tell us that this darkness is actually falling on him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he dies, Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless one, the righteous one, this compassionate healer and this teacher of grace, the Son sent from heaven above, Jesus himself is aware that the judgment of God is falling on him. He himself is facing the very anger of God the judge. On the cross of Good Friday, Jesus, the sinless Son, bore my judgment and your judgment for the wrong that we have done. Remarkably, astoundingly, he faced the judgment that we deserve. That's the first thing that takes place as Jesus dies. Judgment falls. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Our message is called Access Restored. And today we're taking a look at Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. If you joined us a little late, grab a Bible, have it handy, because we're going to get back to this message in just a moment. By the way, if you did join us late, you can still listen online. Come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. You can go back and listen to what you missed. If you ever miss a broadcast in its entirety, you're going to find it archived there as well. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. Another way to listen, the Encounter the Truth app. The uh, app is available at your favorite app store, and it's free. Just simply look for Encounter the Truth. Again, our website, if you want to connect with us, it's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, whether you listen to Encounter the Truth on this radio station, you listen online, or you listen through the app, it's all made possible because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, We want to send you not one, but two copies of Jonathan's book, The King, The Cross, and The Meaning of Easter. And Jonathan, for the person who uh, reads this book, what are you hoping that they're going to take away from it? Well, Steve, I've really got two types of reader in mind for this brief book. One is the follower of Jesus who's grappling afresh with the meaning of Easter and uh, looking afresh at the gospel accounts, particularly John's gospel. This book is based in John's gospel. And I'm trusting that for the believer, there will be a fresh sense of wonder that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is uh, the eternal Son of God, who is supreme in all the universe, nonetheless should allow himself to be subject to a human trial and a human crucifixion, a human punishment for criminals, though he had done no wrong, in order that he might be our Savior. And I think in seeing this, seeing the authority and the humility of Jesus in this, we gain a fresh sense of wonder at who he is, at at his sheer magnificence. And and then for the reader who, who doesn't yet know the Lord Jesus personally, is still grappling with what all this means and what Easter is about, I trust that this presentation of the message of Easter, and in particular the kingship of Jesus, will will help clarify the, the meaning of Easter and who Jesus is, and will help readers to make a personal response. And there is set out there a way to respond uh, personally to the message of Jesus and the person of Jesus. Well, we want to send you not one, but two copies of Jonathan's book, The King, The Cross, and The Meaning of Easter. One for you to read and one for you to give to someone who you know, might be struggling with the true meaning of Easter or someone who doesn't even know Jesus this Easter season, I just ask you to give a gift of any amount. Our toll-free number is 1-833-99-TRUTH. And our website, it's EncounterTheTruth.org. Again, the phone number, 833-998-7884, or the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you did join us a little bit late, we're in the book of Mark, chapter 15, as we continue our message, Access Restored. Once again, here is Jonathan. The next thing that happens is tied to the first, and it's no less significant. As Jesus dies and as judgment falls, Mark wants us to see that access is restored. Verse 37. 
With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Many here will remember that fateful day nearly 30 years ago when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down amid scenes of chaos and jubilation. November the 9th, 1989 stands as a watershed in modern history. The world changed forever that day and many lives in many nations were transformed as a result. But the historical significance of that day and the transformations that it brought about, they pale into insignificance when compared to the transformation brought about on the day when Jesus died 2,000 years ago. The Berlin Wall had stood for less than three decades. It divided societies culturally and militarily and economically. But the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem, it represented a barrier that had stood from the earliest days of human history, right from Genesis chapter 3. And it divided not man from man, human being from human being, but humanity from God himself. Although we were created to enjoy God's presence, to enjoy the life that the maker alone can give, our rebellion, well, it led to judgment and exclusion and ultimately death. That's the story that the Bible tells us. But because Jesus bore the penalty for our sin, he bore the judgment for our sin on that first Good Friday, because he died the death that we deserve, God has once again opened access to his life-giving presence. The temple in Jerusalem was God's symbolic dwelling here on earth. Although he could not allow sinful people into his presence just to wander in, he did come down and rest his presence in the sanctuary at the heart of the temple. And he allowed the priests to approach him in order to offer sacrifices once a year. And within the temple, there were two curtains that kept the general public from seeing or entering the presence of God. But at the moment of Jesus' death on Calvary, one of those great curtains was torn. And notice that it was torn, verse 38, from top to bottom. What's the symbolism of that? What's the significance? God himself tore that curtain and he removed the barrier between himself and his people. The destruction of that wall in Jerusalem was a kind of grassroots activity. The people took charge and as much as anything else, the events of that day signified the fact that the Soviet leadership had lost control of what was going on. The tide of history was against them and it had overwhelmed them. But the tearing of the curtain at the temple in Jerusalem, that was a decision taken from above, orchestrated from above. It was an action, if you like, carried out by divine hands. And what's the significance? This top to bottom tearing of the curtain in the temple of Jerusalem, it tells us that the price has been paid. It tells us that judgment for sin has fallen and has been fully satisfied. It tells us that relationship with God is now open to us once more. And it tells us that life, eternal life, which is available only through God and only in his presence, it is now available to each one of us again. It's a wonderful offer, but none of it is automatic. It's for those who will respond in true faith and accept what he has done. Our Father, we marvel at the fact that the Lord Jesus gave himself for us, that he bore the judgment that was reserved for us, and he died the death that was ours to die. And we thank you that because he did that, Access to your presence is open once more. Friendship 
with you is ours and the way of life is open before us. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonathan Griffiths with a message called Access Restored. You're listening to Encounter the Truth. Glad you've tuned in today. And if you're benefiting from listening, we'd be so encouraged to get your feedback. Let us know how God is using this program in your life. Just come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and click on the contact link. Once again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported broadcast. That's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount, we want to send you not one, but two copies of his book, The King, the Cross, and the Meaning of Easter. And uh, Jonathan, as you sat down to write a book about Easter, what were you setting out to uh, accomplish? I mean, what was your goal as you began to write this book? Well, you know, I'm really fascinated that we've got four Gospels in the New Testament. We don't just have the one. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. And I've always been particularly fascinated by John's account of the Easter story and and especially actually of the, the trial of Jesus uh, leading up to his crucifixion. And, and it seems to me that there's something very remarkable going on as Jesus undergoes the trial of a criminal before he's crucified quite unjustly, entirely unjustly. There, there's something extraordinary that's taking place there, that the, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, should allow himself to be taken through this awful process and should be humiliated in such a way, really, and, and, and willing to endure that. Yeah. And I think within the trial, what we see is, although Jesus is facing trial at the hands of a human judge, what John wants us to see is that Jesus is the judge. And although Jesus stands before a human ruler, what John wants to see is that Jesus is the supreme ruler. And the fact that Jesus, who is judge and who is ruler, should endure these things for our sake, it heightens for us our understanding of his dignity and his grace and his mercy and his majesty. And and that's something I really want to explore and I try to explore in this little book. And I, I trust that sort of walking through that together and exploring it together will be will be rich for readers, will be stimulating, will maybe be a little bit challenging, maybe for some of our perceptions of the Lord Jesus, mm-hmm. uh, and, and ultimately will move us to respond to him personally in faith and adoration. Jonathan, I, I could see for the person who knows Jesus, this is just going to be a reminder of who he is and uh, remind us of the fact that he paid the ultimate price for us in going to the cross and and lead us to worship him. Uh, But for the person who doesn't know Jesus, I could see how this book could even potentially be used to introduce someone to Jesus. And I really hope it will. And the book is is written, you know, with that aim certainly in mind. I, I think it'll be particularly helpful to those who might see Jesus really as a victim in the whole story of Easter. Hmm. You know, you maybe think, well, he's a good man and it's a tragedy that he died in this way. And of course, that's true. But what we see as we really examine the gospel accounts, in particular John's gospel, as we do in, the, in, in this little book, we see that Jesus is not the hapless victim, but he is actually the sovereign God of the universe who is allowing himself to go through this trial and to endure this agony for a set purpose for the sake of our salvation. And so he's doing it in extraordinary grace and extraordinary mercy without sacrificing one ounce of his dignity or even of his control of the situation. And and that's a remarkable thing to understand and to engage with. And I, I trust, yes, I trust it will enable many readers to make a personal response to the Lord Jesus. Well, we would love to send you not one, but two copies of Jonathan's book, The King, the Cross, and the Meaning of Easter. It's our thank you gift for your financial support this month. One copy for you to read, one for you to give to someone who needs to maybe meet Jesus this Easter season. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. Again, the website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and the phone number is 1-833-998-7884. Well, thanks for listening today. 
For Jonathan and for our producer, Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller, and I hope you'll join us next time.